Komon Wandra Nikt, Shridan Shadow Yanga, Shiotan Swevan, Tadat Horn Retchet, Hayodan Shodan, Yala Butum Anu. That was Ildam Kuth, that him the Moster, they might not know the Sasin Shayda, Onda Shadow Bregden, Ak Hay Wachanda, Rathamon and um bad Bolian mood, Biadwa Yathinges. Da come off more on the misly othum, Grendel Gongan, God is here the bar. Mentors a man shader, man of cunas, sumner basurian, in cellar them ayan. Ward under Walkham to thus that hey, ruin wretched, gold cellar gumina, yellow was to whisper, fatum farkne. Nay was that for a massif, that hey, Hrothgar as am you soaked her. Navra he on Alda Dagum, er ne sidan, Yadran Halla, Yal Thena's fund. Come thou to Richida, Rink Sithian, Dramum Bedalad, Dora Suno on an, fear bendum fast, Sithan he here of Fomum at Fran, on Brad the Bialu Higdi, the he a bullion was, wretch as Muthan. Wrath after them on Fagne floor, Fayond Treadada, Eod Eremud, him of the Aragon stood, Lea Yelikos layoked on fire. He came in dark night, the striding shadow goer. The archer slept who that horn gabled hall should guard, all but one. It was to men known that them he could not, when the Lord wished not, the sin scather under the shadows bind. But he, watching, wrathful in horror, waited in boiling mood the battle's meeting. Then came from Moor, under the mist shadows, Grendel walking. God's anger he bore. The crime scather meant to ensnare one of mankind in that high hall. Went under clouds to where he, the wine hall, the gold hall of men, readily knew, golden, gleaming. Nor was that the first time that he Hrothgar's home had sought, yet never in his life, before or since, harder luck and hall things did he find. He came then to the hall, a venturing warrior, deprived of dreams. The door soon gave way, though fast with forged iron bands, when he touched it with his hands. He broke open then, baleful hearted, the hall's mouth. Now he was angry. Right after that, on the shining floor, the fiend trod. He entered in irate mood. From his eyes stood, flame-like, a baleful light. We have heard how the Spear Danes excelled in fight. Noble was Beowulf and bloomed wide his name. By praise deed shall one man thrive amongst mankind. Whether or not the Beowulf epic was based upon an heroic warrior who actually lived, his legendary deeds were recorded in an Anglo-Saxon romantic poem put into written form sometime between AD 997 and 1016. The work of two different scribes is apparent, the second of whom appears more accurate. The manuscript recording a poem likely to have been created long before. Although Northern European in origin, Beowulf's poem was both composed and inscribed on a manuscript in an Anglo-Saxon England. With its 6,356 short lines, 
Lines out of a total body of Anglo-Saxon poetry comprising some 30,000, the importance of the poem for the study of their language has always been self-evident. More recently, the poem has been recognised as a significant work of art. Only in 1936 did Professor J.R. Tolkien, more popularly famous for his Lord of the Rings trilogy than his scholarly achievements, produce a masterly essay, Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics, that revolutionised Beowulf criticism. Where previously the poem had been regarded as little more than a rich mind for linguists, made up from two unrelated stories and containing a number of historically interesting but artistically valueless digressions, Tolkien perceived it as a unified work of art. It is very much a whole work of literary art. It is a composition. And certainly it contains what seem to be digressions, which is very much a modern critical label. But I think it's fair to say that all these things have been shown to be, in various ways, either contrasting or amplifying or otherwise enhancing our appreciation of the world of the poem and the central narrative, which is the life of the hero. Whoever was responsible for the work, it was the product of a Christian England, drawing inspiration from Germanic pagan warrior culture in which monsters were believed to roam dark forests or dwell beneath the lakes. Although possessing no title as such, the epic has been known simply as Beowulf since at least the early 19th century. Its hero presented as a Hercules-like figure who struggles with monstrous creatures helped inspire a race whose impact upon Britain and the world was enormous. Out of the manuscript's Old English tongue developed modern English, now in common use around the globe. The first section of Beowulf's saga tells how this renowned warrior of the Yats, a Germanic tribe occupying southern Sweden, journeyed to Denmark across the Baltic Sea to offer assistance to Hrothgar, its king. Together with twelve companions, the number may have had some religious significance, the hero travelled in a ship, broad-beamed and newly tarred, loading their weapons into the hold. One that, with a wind behind her, flew like a bird. Making landfall in Zealand, now part of modern Denmark, the group was challenged by one of Hrothgar's warriors, who, after escorting them to his king's mead hall, returned to his duties with the words, I am away to the sea to watch out for raiders. These northern Danes, Utes, Angles and Saxons were warlike and aggressive peoples, who fought not only on land, but used the sea for piracy and raiding. Bravery in combat was greatly honored. A raid into the country of Frisia, now remembered chiefly for its Frisian cattle, provides historic data in Beowulf's story. Such warfare bred fierce tribes capable of defeating Roman legions. To inhabitants of gentler southern lands, this was an alien world beyond civilization's pale, whose people were barbarians. An 11th century chronicler would record. And while the whole land of Germany is frightful with thick forests, Jutland is still more frightful, where the land is shunned on account of the poverty of its produce and the sea on account of the infestation of pirates. Cultivation is found hardly anywhere. Hardly any place exists suitable for human habitation. But wherever there are arms of the sea, the country has large settlements. Such impressions long remained. As late as the 20th century, author Alistair MacLean would describe parts of these lands as the hell of our ancient northern European ancestors, of the Vikings, the Danes, the Utes, of Beowulf and the monster-haunted Mears, the hell of eternal cold. Beowulf and his companions arrived safely in Zealand, where formerly King Hrothgar's great mead hall had been won where Joblets had passed among seasoned warriors flushed with beer, who pledged themselves to protect Hierot. For this building was so wondrous as to be given a name. But Hierot had been abandoned, and no warriors feasted and drank within what had become a place of terror. Grendel, a great troll-like monster of lake and forest, angered by the singing of Hrothgar's warriors, had attacked the hall, killing and devouring its occupants so none now dared enter. 
But Beowulf did not fear such creatures, and with the king's permission, he and his companions went into the hall to eat and rest. During the black night, in off the moors, down through the mist bands, Grendel came loping, entering the mead hall to kill and eat one of its sleeping warriors. Beowulf was not asleep, and rising, wrestled so mightily with the monster that Hierot's thick timber walls shook and trembled before he tore off Grendel's arm, causing the creature to run away and die. Great were celebrations, feasting, poetry and song that followed. Wondrous the gifts King Hrothgar heaped upon Beowulf, although unbeknown to all, the peril had not yet ended, but increased. Grendel's mother, monstrous Hellbride, brooding on her wrongs, entered Hierot in furious, vengeful rage, seeking victims. Tearing down her son's severed arm from where it had been Nail's trophy, she seized and ate one of the Dane's greatest fighting men before retiring to a home at the bottom of a blood-stained lake. Asleep in a neighboring hall, Beowulf woke to discover the monster returned back to her dread abode, slaughtering all who dared follow. But Beowulf was unafraid, and armored with a fine coat of chain mail, dived into the lake, swimming down to kill the evil creature in a cavern deep below its monster-infested waters. Greatly honored yet again by Hrothgar, and laden with gold and precious gifts, Beowulf's return to Sweden ends the first section of his saga. This Beowulf epic was probably typical of those told in Germanic royal halls, especially during winter, when howling gales or steadily falling snow made raiding and warfare impossible. Warriors would feast and drink, listening to stories of great bravery against enemies, or even monsters like those the mighty Beowulf had confronted and killed. Northern tribes had defeated and destroyed two powerful Roman legions. And when Britain was abandoned by Rome in the 5th century, Ute, Angle and Saxon increased their raiding against its now defenseless peoples. Long ships grounding on undefended British beaches brought with them a bloodlust that caused great suffering to coastal dwelling peoples. But raiding led to migration and settlement, and soon much of southeastern England was in the hands of peoples European chroniclers would name Anglo-Saxon. Like Beowulf, these warriors often wore chainmail, bearing axe, spear, or sea axe, the short sword that gave Saxons their name. And like their hero, few could withstand them. Much of Roman Britain, occupied by Beowulf's pagan peoples, had already converted to Christianity. But it seems only more westerly British regions retained their faith, and so it recorded held great hatred for these newcomers with their old gods and evil ways. Possibly this was reason why Rome's Pope Gregory dispatched St. Augustine to England in AD 597, where, after landing at Ebbsfleet, Kent, he would convert its King Ethelbert and many of his people. Augustine built his first church at Canterbury, not the great stone edifice of today, but a relatively simple wooden structure that reflected his new convert's timber building tradition. Canterbury Cathedral now stands upon this site, and from its cathedra, or bishop's throne, spread church organization and influence that would soon greatly affect the whole country. Yet this was not modern Christianity with its 2,000 years of evolution, but one developing out of paganism, often with bloodshed, since the old gods had powerful followers. The, the poem as a whole, it provides such a, a very good response to a question, a rhetorical question, which a hardline bishop called Alcuin famously asks uh, in a letter which he uh, has written to the monks, the abbot of an abbey, not quite sure which one, who, where the, the monks have been listening to heroic poetry in their refectories instead of the Gospels. And Alcuin tells them off for this and asks the rhetorical question, what has the hero Ingeld to do with Christ? And in Beowulf we have references to this very hero Ingeld. 
At Bury St Edmunds in East Anglia, Siegbert, its first Christian Anglo-Saxon king, founded a religious community, only to be challenged by Mercia's pagan king Penda, who hated the new faith. Siegbert would be killed in battle, seemingly bearing no weapons, for he had become a man of peace, and it may be his body was carried here for burial. Yet Christianity would continue to extend its influence. King Edmund, also a Christian, was certainly buried here in AD 869 after being murdered by Danes, although Berry has nothing to do with his interment being derived from the Saxon Burra, or fortified settlement. So many events considered miraculous occurred before and after Edmund's burial, he became a saint. Amongst these, it was claimed that his severed head, hidden deep in a forest by the Vikings and guarded by a wolf, instructed the faithful as to its whereabouts so it could be buried on sanctified ground. St. Edmund was the last of the Woofing kings who had ruled the kingdom of East Anglia. Shortly afterwards, in AD 1020, the Danish king Canute, he who is said to have ordered the tide to turn back but failed, in restitution made the saint's burial place an abbey. One at whose high altar, 200 years later, rebellious barons swore to force King John's acceptance of Magna Carta, yet another turning point in British and world history. Even though few traces of its original Saxon work remain, a ruined Bury St Edmunds still displays something of the medieval magnificence inspired by the faith of these converted Germanic peoples. Southeast of Bury St Edmunds and near the town of Woodbridge, Suffolk, lies Sutton Hoo, another Anglo-Saxon site but here on a grassy terrace overlooking the River Deben's estuary. Now part of a National Trust exhibition complex, this 250-acre, tree-fringed open area was obviously a place of great significance for Anglo-Saxon peoples, its undulations and mounds marking burial sites of their great leaders and chieftains. In 1939, just three years after Tolkien's celebrated essay, two funeral ships were discovered here one containing the richest hoard of grave goods ever to be discovered within Britain. This was burial sites of the Woofing Kings, close relations of the Yat tribe to which Beowulf belonged, and descending from the Wolfings, sons of the Wolf, who were the Yat's northern neighbours. Ships were an integral part of northern culture. Beowulf's people had once occupied islands or coastal areas whose few pockets of good land had to be defended against enemies. Baltic forests provided materials for vessels essential to the trading, raiding and piracy that were an essential part of Nordic life. Skilled shipbuilders used the region's fine timber to produce shallow draft longships that could both survive treacherous open waters and negotiate winding inland rivers. The evidence suggests that the Anglo-Saxons, when they travelled about, actually uh, used rivers rather than roads. The people who came before them, the Romans, famous for their roads. But everything leads us to believe that the Anglo-Saxons preferred rivers to move around. They had small boats which they could pass up the rivers. We believe that they came to Westow through a river system. When it came to big expanses of water, like they had to cross the North Sea, a lot of archaeologists believe that what they did was coast hopped. They, they stayed close to the coast, uh, moved down to the narrowest point and then made a dash across that narrow point. Beowulf's people traditionally honoured heroic dead, either cremating their bodies in blazing funeral pyres or interring them beneath earthen mounds that marked their status. The afterlife was important to those living in a harsh world and especially significant leaders might be placed in a funeral ship to journey there. Tolkien's celebrated Lord of the Rings has the warrior Boromir been dispatched to the ocean in this manner. Then let us lay him in a boat with his weapons, and the weapons of his vanquished foes, said Aragorn, so no evil creature dishonours his bones. Although Anglo-Saxons had been settled in England for some 200 years, during which time many had converted to Christianity, at Sutton Hoo in the early 7th century, they followed pagan tradition, although burying two funeral ships, 
rather than sending them out to sea. Amongst other items recovered, there was a hold of superb armor, weaponry, and ornamented grave goods. The vessel itself had all but vanished, but soil impressions revealed it to have been of great size. This was a burial site of the highest status, its accompanying treasure hoard containing a shield emblazoned with eagle and dragon, a magnificent sword with a jeweled hilt, together with fighting spears and axe. Perhaps of even greater significance was a coat of the finest ring mail of such worth that its deliberate burial reveals the great honor being bestowed. Mail coats then and later were so difficult to manufacture, and thus so precious, they were usually handed on for reuse. The Bayard Tapestry shows dead being stripped of their mail coats after the Battle of Hastings in AD 1066. This Sutton Hoo burial also contained a superb ceremonial or parade helmet, ornamented with snake-like crest, face mask, and cheek guards. There were fine bowls, drinking horns and cups, cauldrons and lamps that would be needed by the hero in his afterlife. Everything discovered here, whether armor or weapons, or the clothes, shoes and belts adorned with superb enameling and jewelry, revealed this to have been a leader of great wealth and even greater honor. This would probably be the grave of Radwald, king of East Anglia, who died early in the seventh century, slightly before the Beowulf epic was written. Religious practices suggested by his burial shed light on the mixture of pagan and Christian elements that Beowulf contains. Burials and grave goods, mead halls and kingly gifts tell that Beowulf's people had organized themselves into close-knit and well-ordered societies in which, although predominantly masculine through love of war, women were able to exercise great influence. At this society's head was a king whose power although not always hereditary, was exercised through his thanes, a personal band of warriors selected from a noble class of earls. Below these were freemen commoners who provided essential skills and service, all being seasoned fighters. The whole social structure supported by slaves or serfs were also expected to play a part in battle. Loyalty and service was owed to king or queen and one another. Heroic in historian scale, Beowulf emphasizes more the masculine and military than everyday domestic aspects of what became an Anglo-Saxon society. Even so, there is clear evidence for much domesticity, since these peoples had come as colonizers, not raiders. Anglo-Saxons seem to have occupied villages much like those of their ancestral lands, ignoring former Romano-British settlements creating new dwelling places and shunning earlier towns and fortifications. It's been suggested they may have regarded such places with superstitious awe. At West Stowe, not far from Sutton Hoo, the discovery of an early Anglo-Saxon settlement dating from between about AD 420 and 650 led to the reconstruction of some of its 70 or so former buildings that together with visitor center displays helped bring this period of migration and settlement to life. What is known as the oldest house was built in 1974 and used, amongst other things, to test a concept that these dwellings had been constructed above pits. The sunken house nearby was created on the same assumption, although the concept is no longer supported. There's also a reasonably substantial family house providing insight regarding furnishings and living conditions of the day. Next to it is the hall, hardly a great hall, illustrating that in a small community such as this, it was little larger than many other buildings. These reconstructions were aided by archaeologists' interpretation of Beowulf's poem. Beowulf's struggle with Grendel took place in the King's Mead Hall, its name indicating this alcoholic drink had an important role in ceremonies carried out here. In Seamus Heaney's outstanding Beowulf translation, an attendant stood by with a decorated pitcher pouring bright helpings of mead, and the minstrel sang, filling the hall with his clear voice but that was a far larger structure than existed at West Stowe. Well, the interesting thing about West Stowe is, is that 
archaeology can only give us so much of the information. Um, from that we get um, burned posts, um, we get some remains about the houses, but the Beowulf story gives us much more information on things that archaeology can't give us. For example, in the uh, Beowulf story we get this idea of um, a hall surrounded by houses, and that's how we've reconstructed West Stowe. At Whitchurst, close to the Kentish coast where the earliest Saxon warriors landed, Another hall being reconstructed formerly covered 200 square metres, or over 1,800 square feet in area, more resembling Hierot in scale, although in the poet's rich imagination, the latter surpassed all. Yet there would have been similarities, even though a king's hall must have contained finely carved furniture and been hung with colourful tapestries. Rothgar's Hierot had been wonder of the world forever a hall of halls where he doled out rings and talks at the table. Gold threads shone in the wall hangings. West Stowe buildings help understand Anglo-Saxon daily life, their weaving house indicating that this was a society dependent upon specialized skills. While the varying quality of other structures reveal not all village dwellers were of the same social status. Buildings had panels of wattle and daub between their timber frames. A mixture of clay, wool or hair and cow dung spread over interwoven hazel rods. A system long continued in British rural areas, either washed with lime or spread with tallow to render them waterproof. What people made up this apparently peaceful community and how would the exploits of Beowulf and his loyal band have affected them? The people who lived here in, in West Stowe, these early English, these, these first Anglo-Saxons, were, were a mixture of, of different tribes from different places. But archaeology tells us that they carried spears and, and shields, and the more important of them actually had swords. So in, in, in that way, they are very, very similar to the, the, the kind of warriors we hear about in the Beowulf story. I think the other thing that is interesting is that we're talking about a small village here with not that many people in it. And, and in these early times, the times of Beowulf, um, a gang of maybe um, 10 men is quite a, f a formidable force. And so um, it's interesting that the, the scale of these, these early operations, 10 warriors would indeed be a force to reckon with. And if they were skilled warriors like Beowulf and his men, then they certainly would have been a formidable uh, adversary for anybody. The fierce independence of the Anglo-Saxon is perhaps indicated by British Christianity's ready adoption of pagan designs and traditions. Northern culture and its designs would spread widely, which is appropriate since Beowulf's peoples believed a great serpent lay tail and mouth beneath the sea, forming a circle encompassing all mankind. From this may have developed the convoluted ribbon-like design seen in Christian manuscript illustration artwork, carving and jewellery, probably originating in a Nordic-influenced Ireland. In contrast with the often poor and sandy soils of former Baltic homelands, whose subsistence-level economy inspired raiding and warfare in order to survive, England's attraction lay in it being a naturally rich country, possessing woodlands and soils that bestowed prosperity upon the newcomers. This induced the mass immigration, although whether Romano-British peoples were absorbed or driven westwards is still conjectural. Anglo-Saxon tribes would soon lap against the Welsh mountains, and like the Romans before them, conclude that containment of its warlike peoples was better than outright conquest. By the mid-8th century, Mercia's still pagan king Offa had marked and protected his territories with what is still Europe's longest earthwork. Offa's Dyke runs along the north-south length of Wales from Chepstow to near Prostatin on the North Wales coast, much of its 170 miles of mound and ditch still clearly visible crossing border valley and hill. Offa was one of the greatest kings of Mercia, a kingdom that frequently vied for the paramount position amongst all British kingdoms. His dyke that drew a boundary between Saxon and Welsh territory 
remains one of the greatest engineering works undertaken in Britain prior to the Industrial Revolution, demonstrating the power and organization of these so-called Dark Age kings. Indeed, Arthur's Mercia has been suggested as possible birthplace of the Beowulf epic, because the poem contains a song of praise to an ancestral Nordic king named Arthur. Such fulsome praise providing their monarch with reflected glory appears to have been typical Saxon practice. What we see in the case of Offa the Old, though he is subsumed to be a specifically Mercian ancestor in the Mercian royal pedigree, almost certainly because it suited Offa's own political circumstance of the 8th century, we see evidence on a wider basis that Offa was regarded as a general English ancestor of the people as a whole. And so we get offers in other pedigrees. And this is an important point, I think is sometimes overlooked by the Mercian local patriots. Like its Nordic predecessors, Offa's palace would have been a visible symbol of authority and wealth, wherein would gather the king's personal warriors, whose loyalty depended much upon such gifts he could bestow. When raiding and warfare was impossible, king and warriors would carouse in torch-lit halls at tables laden with platters bearing pig meat or eels, while mead, beer and cider flowed in copious measure. Food and drink was a required provision for service, but other gifts also rewarded bravery, for this was the glue that kept a warlike society together. Armour and weapons were commonly given, but most valued were objects of precious metals or jewels, perhaps garnered as spoils of war or during raids upon some Christian settlement or church. Gifts were presented with great ceremonial, while companions applauded and ancient tales were retold. Lavish rewards I received for my part in battle. Beaten gold and other things. There was singing at the banquet table. An old teller of stories recalled the early days. A battle-scarred warrior bowed with age would remember the deeds of his youth. Pagan, bloodthirsty and warlike though it was, quick to seek revenge for slight or wrong. It is better to avenge dear ones than give way to mourning, says one of Beowulf's followers always ready to fight for honour or die in the attempt. This society placed measurable value upon its individual members, since all, even the meanest, formed part of one social fabric. They had developed the custom of Vergil that related human worth and social status so that loss of life, even injury, had to be recompensed by the perpetrator in money or kind. Here at Westow, the archaeologists have found out that the, the people who lived here, these early Anglo-Saxons, were a very interesting mix of people. There were Angles, Saxons, Frisians, Franks, um, a whole mixture of people uh, who may be uh, joined together in the course of their, their travelling to get here. They came up the rivers in their boats and they settled here in one of these very early pioneering settlements next to a river. We know there were plenty of other settlements up this river, not far from this one, spread all along the River Lark here in, in Suffolk. When they got here, they did some things exactly the same as they'd done in their homelands, like we found um, pottery and jewellery which matches perfectly, and other things um, that were rather different, because over here in, in England, the, the structures that they built, the houses and halls that we hear about in Beowulf, they tend to be separate units where the archaeologists uh, found out that back in their homelands in Northern Europe, quite often they lived in these long houses where the units were joined together. So there are some subtle differences between the way that they used to live on the continent and, and the new way that they lived over here. In Anglo-Saxon England, the king's residence, surrounded by lesser dwellings, would stand within an earth-ditched, timber-palisaded enclosure that protected against human and animal attack. In its mead halls, a warrior brotherhood would have eaten and drank to the excess expected of such great fighters, whose deeds of valor, not only against man, animal, or mythological demon, but at the table, gave them status. In one instance, the poem refers to a particular warrior as Wrecker of Mead Benches. 
Great halls were common to both Anglo-Saxons and their Nordic forebears, playing a major role in the life of the community. Beowulf fought the monster Grendel in such a hall, and in a similar structure dedicated to conviviality, a still pagan offer oversaw a treacherous murder. In AD 792, Ethelbert, an East Saxon and Christian king, arrived at Offa's Hall near Hereford, seeking the hand of his daughter in marriage, only to be killed, and according to legend, having his severed head used by Offa's men as a gruesome football. Buried at nearby Marden, it was claimed a shaft of sunlight suddenly illuminating the grave, together with a spring of water gushing from the ground, so frightened Offa, he not only converted to Christianity, but ordered the body be interred at Hereford in a timber church where now stands its cathedral. Ethelbert's murder reveals that as late as the 8th century, Christianity spread was not without problem. But today's great church dedicated to the saint proves paganism's defeat was inevitable. Close by Hereford, beyond Offa's Dyke, lay a hostile western Britain, now Wales, whose hills, lakes and forests were not dissimilar to some northern homelands and might thus have prolonged or even inspired beliefs that monstrous creatures existed. Certainly many wild animals mentioned in Beowulf were considered either portents of or associated with death. Craving for carrion. The dark raven shall have its say, and tell the eagle how it fared at the feast, when, competing with the wolf, it lay bare the bones of corpses. Although the existence of the Beowulf manuscript had been noted in the 16th century, it was an Icelandic scholar, Thorkelin, who in 1787 first translated Beowulf's poem, perhaps not very accurately from an original manuscript already badly damaged by a library fire of 1753. The hero's name is interesting. J.R.R. Tolkien, whose own 1936 translation spurred great interest in Anglo-Saxon literature, interpreted Beowulf as one who sought honey. Since wolf could mean either the animal itself or one who hunted, and since bears loved honey, Tolkien suggested this was illusion and wordplay. All would have understood as meaning bear hunter, that is, hunter of bears. However interpreted, Beowulf's name must have indicated a man of great physical power whose achievements were worthy of poetic record. He is essentially an ursine superhero. He has these bear-like tendencies. Uh, as brought out in Tolkien, for example, in uh, the character Bjorn in The Hobbit. Um, and many parallels in Old Norse as well, Old Norse saga, his, his parallels in Old Norse saga, one of them actually turns into a, a bear within the battle and uh, helps win the day that way. And this is a characteristic of Northern literature, that sometimes extremes of characteristic could be explained by supposing that at some stage in the family's history there'd been some kind of cross-fertilisation. And the Old Norse puts it quite clearly when it says that uh, the hero's grandmother was a she-bear. The title bear seems often to have been associated with renowned warriors. In these same dark ages, now early medieval, the legendary King Arthur is said to have derived his name from the Latin artos for that animal. Interestingly, this British legend has also a hero fighting mythical beings. The forest swarmed with giants until Arthur, the good king, vanquished them all with his cross sword. The last Roman legionary had only just departed when Arthur, a possible 5th century Romano-British war leader, is said to have defeated the Anglo-Saxons in a series of battles that gained 50 years of peace for Western Britain. There are surprising similarities between Beowulf and Arthur here. Moreover, the roots of Beowulf may lie as deep as the Arthurian tale of the Holy Grail, also possibly linked to ancient cults. It's been suggested by John Grimsby and other researchers that Grendel and his mother may have been a reinterpretation of a fertility cult that preceded not only Christianity, but the ancient gods of Nordic mythology. These Viking gods, 
Wotan and Thor, amongst others, are still commemorated by our days of the week, Wednesday and Thursday. Prior to them, even more ancient divinities named the Vanyar were worshipped. These were essentially fertility cult gods of a religion celebrating winter's end and the coming of spring. Most fertility cults involved human sacrifice to symbolize the death of winter, believing it necessary to renew the harvest cycle. It appears the human victim represented the mysterious god of fertility, who died as the world died in winter in order to be reborn. To Christianity, such practices were abhorrent and damnable, and gods of old religions considered demons. Thus, Grendel is traced back to Cain and brought into biblical reference whereby the monster and his mother are seen as gods in their winter manifestation, who must be slaughtered for the world to begin its renewal. It is pointed out that many secret rituals took place by the side of lakes, wherein female fertility goddesses were believed to dwell, as did Grendel's mother, and where sacrifice would have made their waters equally bloodstained. The passing away of this religion into folk memory may have been catalyst for Beowulf's epic creation. Within the poem itself, there may be another shift of religious allegiance which may account for the formation of some of its narrative. I'm referring to particularly the way Beowulf defeats Grendel and his mother in their submarine lair. Uh, there is an argument that it represents a shift uh, from the much more ancient uh, fertility-based cult where a great goddess resided in a sacred lake. We have a detailed account of this and the Eng English participation in it in the Roman historian Tacitus, his Germania chapter 40. Much of the poem relates to a warrior race with keen appreciation of weaponry and armour. Only those skilled in the use of sword, axe, spear and bow would survive battle or the personal combats by which great honour could be gained. Sutton Hoo's helmet was obviously not intended for war, but display, although Beowulf is said to have worn a helmet made of beaten gold embellished with boar shapes. In reality, any warrior's head would have been protected by a round iron helmet furnished with nasal and eyepiece, his face and neck protected by hinged metal straps. A decorative boar design represented the wearer's fierceness and courage, for this was an animal whose charge could run a spear shaft through the length of its body and still be capable of rending and tearing the hunter who held it. Warriors who had gained wealth through combat or gifts would have worn valuable mail coats made by northern smiths renowned for their metalworking. Beowulf's epic poem makes clear that coats of mail armor were so valuable as to be handed down from father to son. Well, that buried at Sutton Hoo indicates the honour bestowed on this particular warrior. A round wooden shield was also carried, its bearer's personal choice of decoration foretelling later heraldic devices that identified in battle. Beowulf's world traded widely, and he and his followers would have known and employed objects from as far afield as the Middle East and even India. Christian objects and materials would also circulate amongst this pagan society. Booty gained by shipborne warriors who had raided and looted defenseless religious sites and monastic settlements. Even so, this Germanic society seems to have possessed an innate grimness. In far gentler and sunnier Mediterranean lands, Roman and Greek could believe heaven to be a place of golden fields in whose sunlit glades nymphs and satyrs might frolic. But the landscape of darker northern territories was one where human attack or accident might readily be interpreted as the actions of evil creatures always ready to rend or destroy. Seamus Heaney's outstanding Beowulf translation reveals the influence of such dark beliefs. Sometimes at pagan shrines they vowed, offerings to idols, swore oaths that the killer of souls might come to their aid and save the people. That was their way, their heathenish hope. Deep in their hearts they remembered hell. Once again, the poet remembers cults older than Christianity, for it was not the Christian devil these people were worshipping, 
but fertility gods of Christian church are demonized. Other fascinating insights into Germanic society are provided by this poem. Beowulf is portrayed as an honorable warrior who, although brave and fierce in battle, never took advantage of another's drunkenness and could always hold his temper in check. The fact it seemed necessary to record this in such a work suggests it was an unusual warrior characteristic, and thus Beowulf's poem might be considered as much a code of social and military behavior than a record of one man's courageous deeds. There's evidence from this and other early societies that drink, and perhaps even some form of drugs, were taken before battle to inspire what now appears superhuman courage and strength. At the Battle of Stamford Bridge in 1066, a Norse berserker, red-bearded and mighty of limb, probably in a drug-induced frenzy, alone held the River Derwent's bridge against the hall of an Anglo-Saxon army, and all but changed the course of history. Drug-taking has also been traced back to early religious practices, whereby it was believed that drug-induced ecstasies were manifestations of possession by deity. This could also take an animal form, including that of a boar or a wolf, particularly admired for their courage and ferocity. So at what period did pagan and Christian practice blend together as displayed by the Beowulf narrative? Whoever was the actual poet, his knowledge of pagan beliefs and practices is intriguing, since any educated person of that period was almost certainly Christian. It is possible that his personal faith was inextricably intertwined with pre-Christian pagan beliefs. And in this he may have resembled Redwald, king of the Wuffings in East Anglia, greatest of the kings buried at Sutton Hoo. Indeed, there are those who believe that the work would have been composed not long after the time of the ship burial. Given that the Wuffings shared a common culture with the Yats, East Anglia has a strong claim to be the cradle of this astonishing epic. It is certainly very likely that when looking for an inspirational subject, the poet would look to those with a strong affinity to the ancestors of his race. All we have in terms of arguments for the composition of the poem is the text of the poem itself. And I have argued in my own work on Beowulf, neatly published in the little book, The Origins of Beowulf, that uh, a number of independent indications point to a composition several centuries before the surviving copying of the manuscript uh, and in an Anglian kingdom. And certainly Mercia is a possibility, but so is the Kingdom of the Eastern Angles here in Norfolk and Suffolk. And there are a number of independent genealogical arguments which, uh, as I say, converge on that possibility. Whoever composed the work had certainly received a Christian education, producing a version possibly less simple than the pagan original told or sung in mead halls, and laying greater emphasis upon Christian-style traditions and beliefs. Even though Beowulf is not an historic figure as such, the fact certain characters and events portrayed are real suggests his fictional character was inspired by known heroes. There can be no doubt the poem was composed after Ute, Anglo and Saxon tribes landed in Britain, though perhaps based upon more ancient stories amended to suit period and audience. According to the epic, after returning from what is now Denmark to Sweden, Beowulf took part in a disastrous expedition led by King Hygelac into Frisia, largely modern Holland, recorded by Gregory of Tours as taking place in AD 516. With the historic Hygelac killed and his army destroyed, in the poem his widow offered Beowulf the kingdom in preference to her own son. Instead, Beowulf chose to become the young king's guardian and advisor, accepting leadership only when the boy was later killed in battle, thereafter ruling his people in prosperity for some 50 years. The poem's second section concerns an older Beowulf, who, as king of his people, has ruled wisely and bravely for 50 years, a period that ends when treasure beneath an ancient burial mound was robbed and its guardian dragon woken. This ancient funeral barrow, resembling those often be seen against British skylines, is clear reference to Nordic and earlier burial practice. 
A treasure trove of great richness, glittering gold spread across the ground. These ancient tombs are often associated in legend with dread warnings. And so it was in Beowulf's land where the highborn chieftains who buried the treasure declared it until doomsday to be so accursed. But one foolish man ignored this ancient threat, and by stealing a golden goblet from the sleeping dragon's hoard, aroused fire-breathing revenge that killed and destroyed Beowulf's people and belongings. Gold obviously epitomized wealth, often used as kingly gifts to great warriors or placed in their burial hoards. Gold under gravel, gone to earth, and useless to men, says the poem. But it is significant Germanic folklore makes clear the greed gold inspired could also make it accursed. Gold's potential evil is revealed when it becomes cause of Beowulf's death. Beowulf is now old, but has to protect his people. Approaching the tomb bearing a sword and iron shield, the latter to protect him from the dragon's fiery breath, he proclaims, if the evil creature leaves his earthen lair, I shall pursue this fight for the glory of winning. But the hero's personal warriors ran away in fear, only one remaining to help Beowulf face the dragon's fury. There followed a long and bitter struggle until the poem describes how once more the king gathered his strength and drawing a stabbing knife, dealt it a deadly blow. The creature was killed but in its death throes delivered Beowulf a poisonous and mortal wound. Those who might have saved him returned shamefaced from the woodlands into which they had fled, only to find their king dying, his one companion showing Beowulf the gold he had taken from the tomb. Knowing death is near, Beowulf gives instructions for his funeral. Order my men to build a great barrow when my pyre has cooled. It will become Beowulf's barrow and mark the way for ships. The epic poem ends with a long description of the hero's funeral ceremonies that provide epilogue to the whole work. His body being burned on a pyre, hung with helmets and war shields and shining armor. Weaponry that typified his life and people. The flames roar accompanied by sorrowful lamentations from all who witnessed. Like those at Sutton Hoo, Beowulf's remains were interred under a great earthen mound, here raised high above the sea that so influenced these northern people's destiny. The tragedy of this mighty work may mirror a tragic view of life that underpinned Anglo-Saxon society and provided its very roots. What motivates all heroes of the Nordic epic, to which Beowulf is no exception, is the eternal human desire to gain recognition as being of outstanding merit. In this, the role of gifting and treasure is crucial. In the later, more sophisticated and centrally organized society introduced by the Normans, it would be possession of land that bound men together. Barons received lands from the king in return for allegiance, as would their own followers from them. In Beowulf's period, such bonding was fulfilled by the gifting of rich goods, often in the form of cups, rings, swords, and chainmail. The king is referred to as guardian of his people's treasure, and in return receives their loyalty in war and peace. Considered worse than any tyrant was a leader who did not reward service with rich gifts. The whole society seems to have been based on this idea that um, uh, the Lord, uh, which means bread giver, he, he gives something to his household and to his family, he gives them bread, he, he helps them, he distributes his wealth, and in return those people give him back their, their loyalty, their support, and if he needs help they provide it. Um, and, and they were tied together by, by gift giving, by exchanging, um, uh, as we said, uh, gifts in one direction for loyalty in the other, in the other direction. Uh, they built strong bonds through time and these may have been important um, things for the Anglo-Saxons, far more important than they, they were, they are for us today. 
But in the culmination of Beowulf's epic, such treasure brings about the final catastrophe that is Beowulf's death. Earth buried gold, useless to the ancients who have passed away. Discovered by a dragon who guards the rich trove fiercely, even this creature has no use for it, but wreaks havoc when one small item is pilfered. Nor is the treasure of any use to Beowulf himself, who dies because of its existence. Thus, by recording what seems a simple fight with a dragon, the poet questions the bonding material of his own world, finding within a deep emptiness that bestows the poem with great poignancy. To achieve his effect, the writer employed a number of poetic devices, although Anglo-Saxon poetry did not use the rhyme that became commonest of poetic tools. Instead, the poet employed constant alliteration, using the same letter to begin the words that make up half of a short line. Each line is a caesura, breaking in the middle, that provides a sense of tension. Certain phrases repeat themselves, and in so doing, bring with them a richness of use from their context in other parts of the poem. Finally, kennings are used, something between synonyms, that is, words meaning the same things, and guessing games. A sword becomes a battle friend. A demon is a shadow walker, and the sea, the whale's road. By their use, the poet encourages a creative attention in his listeners, as well as opening up a richness of vocabulary later English was never again to possess. Further, the poet uses references once thought of as digressions, but now seen to play an essential role in the thick layering of a narrative whose heart cause the story of combat against three monstrous beasts. That is the heart, if you boil it down, of our narrative. But what our poet has done, he has taken this storyline and turned it into much more than a mere folktale. It is one of the great epics of world literature. An epic in which these three monster hero combat scenes become three moments in an exemplary life of our idealised mortal hero, confronting the big questions of life, the universe and everything. And interwoven into that basic threefold structure are the ancestral traditions and legends of the old English people. Woven into it that gives it its great geographical and historical perspective located in the 6th century Northlands. Anglo-Saxon paganism would end, its culture change and its Christianity develop sophistication far beyond that of the Beowulf epic. Even in what appears to be an essentially pagan work, there are strong Christian elements, with much of the story being told in this context. Many scriptural references are made to the Old Testament. Andy Orchard's book, A Critical Guide to Beowulf, makes the point that apart from overt references to the Cain and Abel story, there are 12 key points in which the battle with lake and fell dwelling monsters parallels the story of David and Goliath. For example, Beowulf removes his breastplate, helmet and sword before the battle, as does David, and both return with a sword and head of their opponent. England, where Britain, Angle, Ute and Saxon merged into one race, waxed and prospered until invaded by the Normans, another warrior people also originating in northern lands. By AD 1066 and the Norman conquest, Beowulf's once pagan saga had helped spread Christianity throughout the land to its farthermost regions. But like the Romano-British before them, a rich and largely civilised Anglo-Saxon society would change suddenly and bloodily at the hand of warlike invaders. In 1066, the people who had conquered Britain and created epics such as Beowulf would fall before even more warlike, better armed and better organised Norman invaders led by William the Conqueror. In 1066, Harold Godwinson, the last Saxon king, would be killed by an arrow at the Battle of Hastings when his Nordic people would be subjected by another. Defender and invader, both of Nordic origin, had been molded by the lands their ancestors had invaded and settled. England helping create Harold's race, 
Normandy, those who followed William. During centuries after the conquest, Anglo-Saxon and Norman would meld into an English people possessing their own particular language and culture. The rediscovery of Beowulf's epic proved it to be foundation of this English tongue and part of a wonderfully varied literary heritage containing such masterworks as Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, Shakespeare's plays and the King James Bible. Churches and cathedrals that developed from the early faith of Beowulf's race still dominate the land these peoples once occupied, while much of their former pagan beliefs remain interwoven into British legend and folklore. But even more important is that the tongue in which Beowulf was written founded modern English a worldwide international language whose continuing evolution provides a subtlety, vocabulary and richness far beyond that of any other. Part of me says that the, the Beowulf story really is um, exactly what the Anglo-Saxons were about. When you're talking about archaeology and evidence all the time, it's very difficult to get into the minds of the people who lived then. But I think the Beowulf story is a fantastic insight into their minds. Even though no acknowledged funeral mound marks where lies this vanished hero, Beowulf's greatest memorial is the wondrous language his epic poem helped found. So lamented the Yayat's people the fall of their loaf lord, his hearth companions. They said that he were of world kings, of men the mildest, and the gentlest, to his people the kindest, and for fame the most earnest. Swa bec nornadan yeata leoda, chlafordes grira, eort yachneatas, Quedan datiwara, warol kuninga, mana mildost, and mon thwarost, leodom lidost, and lof yeonost.